Um, now can I invite to the stage Ruha Devanasan from Google. All right, thank you for being here with me. Uh, I'm really glad to be here with all of you here in Geneva, but I'm gonna ask you to bear with me for a few minutes and imagine you're back home, sitting on your sofa in your house. You get a notification on your phone, you look at it, and it says severe flood warning for 24 hours from now, not just for your district or your state, but your neighborhood and in fact your street. What would you do if you had 24 hours notice with certainty that your street was going to be flooded? Would you make a plan with your family members on how to get out of your house and where to go? Would you go down to the municipal office and get some sandbags to put around your house? Would you move your precious possessions to higher ground inside your house? Uh, come up with a plan for your pets, come up a with a plan for your farm animals if you own farm property. Would you go and visit your neighbor who you know maybe doesn't have a mobile phone uh, and tell them, hey, a flood is coming tomorrow? This is what Google is really interested in. If we could give people accurate and actionable alerts ahead of time, how can we help them really prepare in the short term and get themselves and their loved ones to safety? Now, our flood forecasting work is part of a broader set of AI for social good initiatives. And Google has been working with AI for the last few years and we recognize the power and the impact of artificial intelligence to help solve really complex mathematical uh, and computational problems. So things that used to take hundreds of hours of human work to compute now take seconds and can be done in real time. We're applying AI for social good across many sectors, including the health sector, um, climate change, environmental issues, and we also want to find ways to apply it in humanitarian work. So we chose flood forecasting for a few reasons. One, we know, and, and you all know because you're here at this conference, that floods have some of the greatest impact on societies around the world when we think about natural disasters. About 2.3 billion individuals are affected every year by floods. We know that between 6,000 and 18,000 people die every year from floods. And we know floods can cause up to $10 billion worth of damages, economic damages, and especially affecting those who are most vulnerable in society. This is one of the reasons we chose to focus in on this particular natural disaster. Uh, another reason is we know that early warnings can be extremely effective in helping avert the costs of natural disasters. So up to 35% of fatalities can be averted, up to 43% of economic damages can be averted if people are just warned in time to take action and get out of harm's way. And a third reason is we know that floods and flood forecasting is a particular area in which um, there are factors that contribute to floods that are somewhat predictable and somewhat unpredictable and the computational power it takes to estimate exactly when a river will flood, where it will flood and by how much. It's complicated and it can be solved potentially with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we explored this field and we said, well, why Google? And this is a question we ask ourselves often. Is it really our place to be doing this work? What can we contribute to society in this space that others maybe cannot? And a few answers came to us. One is our machine learning capacities. Two is the computational powers we have at Google. And then three, um, which Elliot Christian referred to, is, is the surfaces that Google has that the public interacts with anyway. So people come to Google search, people come to Google Maps in a crisis looking for what do I do now? And a few years ago, we didn't have good answers for them. So we realized we need to build those answers into our platform so when people come to us in a crisis, we can give them immediate information on what to do, where to go, and how to get to safety. 
We also know that we cannot do this work alone and we should not do this work alone. So we invest in really deep partnerships with government, with academia, and with nonprofits who have been thinking about floods, who have been thinking about flood re resilience and flood forecasting for longer, uh, to be frank, than Google has even been alive. So our, our partnerships in this space are really deep and, and it really is the only way in which we can do anything meaningful in this space. So what am I even talking about when I, when I talk about Google's flood forecasting? Uh, the area which we've, focused to, uh, we've chosen to focus on in the beginning is river floods. Um, and our efforts are really in, as you can see in this video, trying to make a model that gives a sense of when a river uh, is, has extra water in it, where does that water flow? How does it flow? Where does it overflow onto the banks and by how much? And by doing that, what we can do is then warn people in those areas that the, the waters are going to rise, and more importantly, show them places where they can go that are not flooded. Um, now, these models exist already today. Um, there are many, many scientists, many people around the world who are doing this work. What we're doing to contribute to this field is really providing higher quality imagery and the computational power of Google to make this forecasting faster so we can get it out to users in a timely manner. And this is how we do it. So uh, we start with satellite imagery from multiple sources and we make what's called a digital elevation map from that imagery. We then partner with government authorities. Uh, we've started this work in India with the Central Water Commission and piloted in Patna, which is a, a, a city, a town on the Ganges River. What we get from the Indian government is river gauge measurements that, that tell us the level of the river and also the flow of the water. And we also get weather forecasts from them. We then combine all of this data to create an inundation map, which in simple terms means where the river flows when it flows outside of its, its normal pathway. Now, there are a couple of challenges in this work, generally in the flood forecasting field. One challenge is the granularity or the, the resolution of imagery. So the image you see on the left is based on um, satellite imagery that was collected in the year 2000. It's almost 20 years old now. Uh, and you can see the resolution is not that great. So flood forecasting using data from SRTM kind of looks like uh, the image you see on the left. Our goal is to get to something on, like the image you see on the right where we can really pinpoint where is the river flowing and overflowing and who do we need to warn exactly. Another challenge with uh, the elevation maps we currently have is that because they're based on satellite data from 20 years ago, they're based on a picture of the river from 20 years ago. And anyone who works with rivers or lives by a river knows that rivers change over time, especially rivers that flood, right? So you can see in the image on the right, uh, this is a river changing shape over time. You can see how it changes over the decades. It changes its course, it changes its width. Um, and so it's really hard, again, to predict and send alerts out to people along the river path about flooding when we don't even know what the river looks like today. So we've talked about um, the, the resolution of imagery. We've also talked about the recency of the imagery. And um, what we do at Google, the approach we're taking is instead of relying on very expensive specialized satellite imagery that's used for digital elevation maps, we take images that are collected every day anyway for Google Earth. They're collected on a daily basis. They're collected around the world. And then we stitch them together using artificial intelligence um, to create a sense of what the terrain looks like. And we can do this in any part of the world because we have Google Earth imagery for the entire planet. So we compare different images of the same location to each other. How is the light hitting that location? Uh, what are the camera angles? And then we compute what the terrain looks like based on the differences between those images. And what that gives us in, is an elevation map that looks like something on the right. So 
in comparison to what we used to be able to do, you can see we have a lot more detail in our elevation map than we used to have. Um, but this isn't good enough yet because the elevation map includes things like trees and bridges that water can flow under, water can flow through, and so it's not an accurate representation of which parts of the terrain are blocking water or changing the water's flow. Uh, we then uh, pass this through another round of artificial intelligence and computing where our machines take out objects that look like trees or look like bridges and only leave in objects that will block the water. We then get what's this image on the right, which is just the objects on the landscape that are going to block and direct the flow of the water. So you can imagine, just for the Putna region, the computational costs this took. Uh, it's, it's pretty complicated um, and very expensive computationally. If we're trying to scale this work beyond Patna to the rest of India and beyond the rest of India to the entire world, the computational co costs multiply incredibly. And so, Another aspect of Google's flood forecasting work has been to reduce those computational costs by uh, teaching our machine learning models how to do these equations themselves. So uh, I'm sure you've all seen these equations, very familiar to you, probably learned about them in grade two, grade three. Just kidding. I don't, I don't understand these myself. Um, this is just to show you the, the process our engineering teams go through. So they take physics equations, they teach our machine learning models with these equations, and then they run the input data through those machine learning models. So things like river gauge data and forecasts, uh, our digital elevation maps, and what they get is a, uh, a, for a forecast model that looks kind of like this. Now this is all very cool and fancy, but what's the point of this? The point is really to make sure we get accurate alerts out to individuals. And so we take three approaches to get those alerts out and to get them out in the right channels. Uh, one method that we take is to use Google's own platforms to get the message out. So Google has a product called Google Crisis Alerts, which is basically a box at the top of Google search uh, that pops up when a crisis is happening in your location. And this box gives you top news about the crisis as it's happening. It gives you a map of the affected area and will drop a pin on which area is affected or will draw a polygon if we're gap getting cap alert feats from the government. Um, we also give emergency numbers from local emergency authorities. And if we know that someone is searching the area uh, in the English language, but they're in a nation where English is not the first language, we also translate a few phrases for them. So translate, for example, with the Palu tsunami into Bahasa, Indonesia, how do I find the nearest hospital? Where do I go for the nearest shelter? So um, these crisis alerts have been around for, for a while now. We've used them across many different hazards. But what does this look like for flood alerts? Well, we tested this last year in Patna. Uh, we ran our flood forecasting models and then we sent out alerts to people in the Patna region. So first, when a flood uh, was approaching, people got Android notifications that said severe flood situation for the Ganges River in Patna. They then, if they clicked on that Android notification, it would open up into Google search into an SOS alert. And you can see the affected area map is much more granular, much more high resolution than the usual crisis maps we put out. Uh, it has levels of severity color coded so people can zoom in and, and identify is my street in the red area, is my street in the, in the lighter area. Uh, they can also identify then where do I go next in order to get to safety. So this is one channel through which we get alerts out and through which we use this flood forecasting information. Another channel is to get, the, get those forecasts back to the government, back to the national government and the local government. And we do that in a much more detailed format than the information we push out to the public. And we know that that information can be used to help that government build its resiliency efforts and build its long-term policies around floods. Uh, a third channel we take is working with local nonprofits to reach users who may not be online and may not be on mobile phones. So in the Patna region in our pilot, we piloted with the Seeds Foundation who actually went out into the community and alerted community members around these floods. Before the floods came, 
our, our partner engaged in preparation action with the community. So here you see volunteers uh, doing a presentation on evacuation routes for members of the village. And we believe this, this partnership, both with government as the authority and the authoritative source of information, and with nonprofits who truly understand the local context and the local needs, is crucial to making these alerts useful across many different populations in affected areas. So this is just the beginning. We're very hopeful from the work we've seen so far. Uh, and we're extremely excited to be here at the platform with you all because we know the partnerships we build in these next two days will really help us scale this work across the world. Thank you. <laughs>